from Columbia in high definition. This is WIS News 10 Awareness. Good morning and thank you so much for joining us for Awareness. I'm your host, Megan Norman. In the early 1900s, African Americans broke the color barrier in film. But at the time, the roles were very few and far between. Now you can see blacks portraying characters on the big and small screen, from presidents to prostitutes and everything in between. Here to give us an overview of the history of African Americans in cinema is Janelle Rohan with the Nickelodeon Theater. Thank Good you morning. so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Let's take it back to the beginning and talk about some of the stereotypical roles African Americans found themselves portraying. Um, Absolutely. Well, in the beginning, um, obviously, we weren't even allowed into movies, right. so there was a lot of blackface and um, portrayals of what white people thought that black people acted like. Mm -hmm. And when we were allowed into the films, finally, it was sort of an extension of that, where we weren't allowed to uh, act in ways that were natural depictions of black life or uh, black characters, but rather caricatures. Right. And so we had things like uh, Mammy. Um, there was a show that Hattie McDaniels was in called Beulah, um, which a lot of people don't know about, but before Gone with the Wind, there was Beulah, and she was um, a house servant for a white family. Um, and that was that served to really solidify the, the Mammy role. and. Um, you still see Mammy showing up in, in shows today. So that stereotype has not gone away. There's the Jezebel, who's the extremely um, lewd and over hypersexualized black woman. Um, and then there's the, the sassy black woman who, you know, will often show up as like the secretary or, you know, uh, a sassy best friend um, or something like that. And so we still see that for women. And then for men, there's a lot of um, sort of, uh, you know, blue collar, manual labor, farmers, mm -hmm. um, sharecroppers, um, very um, silly and over the top antics. So, um, and do we normally see these roles um, as sort of supporting roles? Rarely do, do we see them as the lead. I know um, back and, in the day, not so much. Not so much, but I think what a lot of people don't know is that um, there was somewhat of a, a, a black Hollywood for, for a time because it, it grew out of a necessity to create, mm -hmm. um, create media and, and films and characters that they could uh, relate to and really have the space to express what they felt like needed to be seen um, from, from black film and black cinema. And would you say Spike Lee's films sort of lend, lend, lend themselves to that? I would say, um, I don't know how far back we want to go. <laughs> I know we don't have a lot of time, but I, I would definitely say like even in the 20s and 30s, um, sort of adjacent to the, the Harlem Renaissance, there was a, a big movement of films um, that featured um, all black casts and black directors. They were on very uh, small shoestring budgets, but um, they were taking control and autonomy of the work that they were putting out. And then there came, um, even before Spike Lee, there was a movement of uh, black filmmakers. Once they started to um, desegregate UCLA, the film school there, mm -hmm. there was a core of black filmmakers there who all worked on each other's projects and supported each other's work and ended up making this uh, body of films that really was very resistant to the popular notions of black people and, and mainstream Hollywood. And that was called, after the fact, the LA Rebellion. And there have been books written about it and uh, Charles Burnett, who directed Killer of Sheep, Julie Dash, who did Daughters of the Dust, Jama Fanaka, uh, rest in peace. Um, they, there are, I mean, that's just a few of the names, but there are so many people who even before Spike Lee were making these films that said, uh, you know, black exploitation is not necessarily us. Um, mm -hmm. All of these things that you see, we're not all maids, we're not all service workers, right. and uh, we, you know, our families and all have absentee dads and, right. you know, things like that, so. And how do you think that has continued to evolve today? Um, I know we had movies like The Help, very recent, which absolutely. still portrays the maid and sort of the mammy figure. Right. I think that it's very um, two-pronged because now we have a very burgeoning independent art world, uh, independent film world. And so what I'm seeing, um, especially at festivals and things like that, is this really exciting sort of uh, resurgence or renaissance in black film. Mm -hmm. and. Um, 
But what I will say is that in mainstream Hollywood, the, the roles are sadly um, as limit, nearly as limited as they have been um, historically. I just I think that there hasn't been as much evolution or progress there as uh, I would like to see, and I'm sure black actors and even um, black movie makers, filmmakers, people behind the screen would like to see. And um, it's unfortunate, but Hollywood is also a business. It's you know the the Very mixture true. of art and, and business. Right. And, um, and so how so, do we start to change that? Um, well, I'm a huge proponent of you know independent film. Um, I, I think I mean, at the Nickelodeon, for instance, I'm doing a black film festival called the Blacktastic in August. And I think one of the, the key ways to, to start to really change uh, the face of black characters in film is to support black films that have characters that have more depth mm -hmm. and humanity and show them as uh, people. And, and, and sort of transcend race. Like there maybe will, will come a day when we have uh, a film that has black characters that isn't about blackness or what people mm -hmm. assume to be blackness, but is a, is a human story that just happens to have black characters. Um, but the way it is in Hollywood, if you have a film that's all black cast, they have to find a way to market that as a black movie. And um, does Tyler Perry fit into that as an example? Absol well, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, Tyler Perry has done something very interesting, which is he's been able to capitalize on, um, you know, this, this big segment of our, of our black population that wants to see those kind of movies, and we right. can't deny that. Right, there is a demand for it. There is a demand for it, and there are a lot of people who find that kind of movie-going experience cathartic. And so I like to stay away from criticizing him as much as saying that w the, the main issue for me, for me or in my estimation, is the lack of options, right? So when you have such a, pos a paucity of um, work in the first place that depicts black people, then we're a little bit more, we tend to be a little bit more protective and critical of what we do see right. put out there. Right. And so, you know, Tyler Perry's doing his thing, but there's not enough uh, on the other side right, of to that. to balance it out. Exactly. Like another Cosby show, Exactly. And so that's where the problems come in. Um, I remember when Precious came out mm -hmm. and people were all, you know, all in a tizzy about Very the portrayals about in that mm -hmm. film. And I think, you know, on one hand, I think, yeah, that's, you know, it's unfortunate that whenever there's a successful black film, it shows black people as monsters in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, but on the other side of that, I feel that it's very sad that black filmmakers have to be bound to this burden of representation that uh, filmmakers of other races don't necessarily have. Right. Um, I don't necessarily think that's fair to an artist um, of any ethnicity that they have to carry the entire burden for representing their race because there isn't enough material out there for people to have the choice right. or for people to see, you know, wait, you know, maybe this is an aspect or a representation, but there are all these other representations that deserve mm -hmm. attention as, as well. well. All right, well, Janelle, we will continue this conversation after our break. While the field has opened up for blacks in film, not everyone is pleased with the roles some actors choose and when Hollywood decides to take notice. Still to come on Awareness, we'll discuss the controversies and criticisms of black Hollywood. Welcome back to Awareness. It's been said African Americans get Hollywood's highest honors only when they play unfavorable characters. That is just one of the criticisms black actors sometimes receive. Here to weigh in, Janelle Rohan, Carlton Clay, and Darian McLeod. Thank you all for being with us this Thanks morning. Thanks for having us. Well, first question I want to start with is, do black actors get typecast too often? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Obvious question. <laughs> Obvious <Next> answer. Question. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that, though? Um, I mean, there's, there's a multitude of reasons. Of course, you're talking about race, and you're talking about the United States of America. So you, you I mean, systemically, historically going back. But to piggyback on something Janelle said, I, one of the ways to address it is to support uh, people who are doing the work that you support. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the things you can say about Tyler Perry, whatever you want, his people support him. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. they show up, they, they vote with their dollars, they vote with their feet. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there are actually a lot of good actors and directors and writers doing good work, but work costs money. Right. Work costs time. Worst right. co cost training and education right. and distribution and all those good things. So, 
I think also um, a really interesting example was uh, at the end of last year when Best Man Holiday mm -hmm. came out, mm -hmm. and uh, you know these distribution companies and all the people who do the box office numbers saw black people or people in general just coming to see this movie in droves and they were like, wait a minute, what's happening here? Like this is an all black cast film mm -hmm. and it was just killing the box office right. above all of these you know, white movies um, that were out at the time. Um, and I just think that it's, it was kind of inspiring and exciting because I feel like it kind of proves that the tide is changing just a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, and that we can have a film be sort of unilaterally successful and not just a successful black movie. Right. Now, Darian and Carlton, both of you are actors. Mm -hmm. And what kind of roles have you played? I will let Carlton Okay, well, um, I think I've, I've played, I've been the angry black man before. Uh -huh. I've been the best friend. Uh -huh. um, de 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 there's definitely been typical, uh, typical, stereotypical roles that I have played. But I also believe that, you, and I'm a writer as well, I believe you need to, um, you know, be the change that you want to see. So I feel like you can create, you know, different opportunities for yourselves out there. Also, um, just to piggyback on what, you know, has been said, um, you can, there have been like, for instance, Kevin Hart was in Ride Along and they broke records in, broke records in January um, for a top gross movie or something like that. And Kevin Hart has played different roles that weren't intended for a black man. But it was like, oh, well, Kevin Hart, let's see if Kevin Hart can do this. And he's definitely made changes. So I feel like you can, you, you have to just put yourself out there. And I feel like you can kind of be that change that you want to see in, in the world. I feel like we just have to just take that leap of faith and just make it happen ourselves sometimes. Right. And Darian, what kind of roles have you played? Um, everything. That, uh, I'm an actor. So I've, I've been lucky enough to play roles that were written, written for white actors. Mm -hmm. And after the, the writer saw it, he's rewritten a role. Mm -hmm. Mm. This will always be cast as a black person. Mm -hmm. I've been lucky enough to, I do a lot of children's theater. Um, I played the, the hero and I played the villain. I played, uh, you know, I'm an actor. That's, that's what's compelling to me. I played and all types of roles. You have mm. to be. That's, well, you don't have to be necessarily. There, there are tons of actors who are very successful doing one thing. Mm -hmm. That's great for them. Mm -hmm. That's not what appeals to me. What appeals to me is to do as many different things well, to tell the story many different ways. I've been a, a, a rabbit. I've been a turkey. I've been a, <laughs> a, a, a homicidal maniac. I've been a lawyer. I've been an old man. I've been a three-year-old. You I just mean, take roles that appeal to you, that you feel like you can do well. Right, and I take roles that I think that I can do well, that challenge me, but I also, I'm very conscious, and I think probably most actors of color, not just black people, but most actors of color, do feel a, a certain responsibility to. There are certain roles I have turned down mm -hmm. because I've been uncomfortable with right. what I thought that role meant. But at the same time, I've taken roles that other people may have wanted to challenge me about because I, if, if it within what I thought were um, good stories. I'm looking for a good story. Right. Well, let's talk about awards because when it comes to Hollywood, sometimes you see the awards going to the pimps, the drug dealers, mm -hmm. the prostitutes, and the slaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are so much more versatile than that. Exactly. So why are we not getting awards for different roles? Um, well, I would like to just say what's un unseen is that it's the composition of the voters, I think. Mm. Um, and, and that has a lot to do with what you see in, in the films as well as the people behind the screen, the people who are writing, choose casting, um, directing, all of these things. But as far as the awards are concerned, um, the Academy award, uh, voters are largely white and largely male. Right. And so um, a lot of what they choose, I feel has to do with um, their notions of what a compelling black performance right. entails. I think a problem too is that a lot of blacks look for the awards. I don't understand why we feel like we have to receive some type of recognition. I, I just feel like sometimes we, it's, to me, I guess, because I'm an artist, and I just kind of feel like it's about the work and about the presentation that you give. A lot of times we look for those accolades from the academies or from the Emmys and everything. Right. And that, I mean, yes, granted, we should be recognized, but it shouldn't be all about that. And a lot of times I think we focus on, uh, I need to get an academy or I need to get this, and wow. instead of focusing on the work sometimes. I don't think that's an exclusive, exclusively black that's, it's thing. Not. It's, it's yeah. not. That's a career thing. For it most is, right. but I, I do see a lot of blacks, though, however, complain about, well, 
he should have got this or he shouldn't have got that instead of focusing on the great work that they did in that particular art form. Well, I, I think, once again, it's about support. You know, people being supported, they can feel comfortable about their work, they can feel comfortable to take more chances, um, or not, you know, some, it depends on your situation, but I do know the more support, it, it's anything, if you like a can of soup, and you go out there and buy that can of soup every day, you tell all your friends, hey, this is the greatest can of soup ever, and everybody's buying a can of soup, they're gonna make more cans of soup. If you're not buying a can of soup, that can of soup is gonna go away. Right. Um, the same thing with um, artistic content. Um, not only with, uh, I, I primarily do theater, but not only with theater and films and music and, and literature, with everything, you know, vote with your, you know, it's okay to say, oh, that's nice. If you like it, support it. Right. Support it. Absolutely. Well, Janelle, earlier we talked a little bit about the stereotypical roles, and while none of you, uh, act in reality television. Let's talk about <laughs> some of the oh. ratchetness that we see. Do you think that She went straight to ratchet, I, I like yes, that. Yes, yes, <laughs> because that's what a lot of it is mm, to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but are the, how are these roles um, perpetuating some of these stereotypes? Well, I mean, that's it. A lot, of, uh, a, a lot of these stories are told, are stories that, to be telling us, I think they're stories that make other people comfortable. Um, there's a perception that this person from this place is this, and this person from that place is that, and this person of this color and this gender, they're like this. Oh, yeah, reality TV is notorious for those uh, labels and those boxes mm -hmm. and those, you know, it's sort of like microwave food. It's very easy, right. you just, you know. Right. And um, I also think that we have to acknowledge that with these labels and these sort of oppressive stereotypes comes a certain amount of power. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with power dynamics um, of the people who are, like I said, producing. And I always go back to uh, the people who are creating this work because um, it's a very conscious decision. I don't want anyone to think that any of what they see is accidental. A lot mm -hmm. of um, this reality TV, these girls are very, I would say these girls because I actually uh, in grad school studied um, black women in reality TV, in particular, <laughs> in particular love and hip hop. And in these, these shows where these girls just go at each other, they fight and right. it's, they're all, you know, their livelihood and their success is always connected to a man. And so you start to notice these very specific tropes, right? And right. Um, it's interesting, but you, you realize that there is someone behind the scenes saying like, these are the stories that we're gonna punch up right. and pay right. attention to. Right. This girl it's, doesn't it's have enough drama. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right. this girl right. doesn't have enough drama, so we're not gonna show her as much. Right. And, um, and then you have you know, um, Betsy Smith yes. in there, the Midwest watching roles. this, mm -hmm. thinking, wow, you know, this is, if this, this is, is reality. If this is her right. only it's interaction. Reality right. TV. Exactly, this yeah. is, and if this is your only interaction with black people, what you see on TV, right. You, you know, it's, it. yeah. it's you ever well, talked with anyone who actually, I'm sure you have, who actually does reality TV? Well, I, I yeah. have. I just, I just kind of believe that, you know, yes, it's behind the scenes stuff happening, but also, too, you, you perpetuate that. You give them what they want. Absolutely. So it's like, you know, they can only edit what you put on camera. You if you're that. throwing glasses at people or you fighting people, that's just what you're giving them. Oh, yeah. Right. So, I mean. Well, as, there's, a, a, there's a certain amount of celebrity, that instant celebrity right. that comes along you, with this. I know we it. just got into this topic, and I know it's a very good one, but we're going to have to go. But, <laughs> okay. but thank you all so much for joining us. I know we cannot continue this discussion on our Facebook page. Well, race takes center stage at a Columbia theater. After the break, we'll hear from a cast member about how this controversial topic plays out. Welcome back. It's a controversial subject many people try to avoid, but race is often at the center of many polarizing situations. A play at the Trustus Theater takes this topic head on, and it just wrapped up last night. Here to share his experience in the play called Race is Darian McLeod, who plays Henry Brown. Right. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. Let's give our viewers a quick synopsis of Race. Well, Race is a play written by David Mamet, um, done by my company, the NIA Company, at Trusted Theater. And it's a uh, quick synopsis is a uh, rich, a billionaire uh, white man is accused of assaulting a young black woman. He approaches a law firm that is um, manned by a black lawyer and a white lawyer thinking that he could play the race card to his advantage. There's also a new young black female lawyer um, on staff. And while the two lead partners are des deciding whether or not to take the case, the younger female does something, woman does something that makes them have to take on the case. 
So the rest of the play is about how do we defend this person? How, does, how do we play mm -hmm. race? What does race mean in this situation? What does race mean with the jury? What does race mean with the judge? What right. does race mean? So it's, right. it's, a, it's, it's compelling. It's a talker. It opens up dialogue oh, about yeah. race. Yeah, that's one of the things, uh, Nia, one of our mantras is, we don't tell you what to think, but we give you something to think about. Right, right. And now the writer is, is white. He's right. a white man. How do you think his racial bias went into the play? Well, I think it's all over the play. <laughs> that's one of the things that made it interesting to us. The idea that a uh, rich, white, conservative male wrote this. Our director for this project is a white female, and Nia is a multicultural um, company, black, white, at times, at one, at points we've been black, white, Asian, and Hispanic. Wow. Um, so we thought it was an interesting com um, combination and an interesting way to spur conversation and dialogue. Um, it's not necessarily that we agree with every point, but we think it's something worth talking about. Right. And finally, how do you think your racial bias went into you playing your role? Uh, my racial bias going to play in my role, that's different. I, I don't, I think Henry has his own biases. I don't think they're mine, but at the same time we share. What I try to do with any character, whether it be a spider or a woman, mm -hmm. I try to approach from commonality. So I try to find the things that we have in common. Right. Usually it's love. We all love, we all want something, we all need something. So I approach it from that. Speaking to Henry's particular politics, we don't share but I understand a lot of his particular politics. We're of similar age, brought up around the same time, the same kind of values in that um, culture where I think kids were raised, uh, black kids were raised, you have to be three times mm -hmm. as good and mm -hmm. expect to get half exactly. as much. So we kind of shared these different things. So I kind of went through and found things and plus, I'm an actor. Um, right, but like you said earlier, you just find that commonality. But right. Darian, thank you so much for being with well, us. Thanks, this thanks morning. for having me. We'll be right back with a final thought. Despite the critiques, African Americans are making strides in Hollywood, albeit slow going. At times, the images portrayed might not shine a favorable light. It is up to each individual to censor the subject matter. The bottom line is different things make us laugh think twice, or keep us talking. What works for some might not work for all. If you don't like what's on, you have every right to turn it off. We'd like to thank all of our guests this morning. Until next time, I'm Megan Norman. This is Awareness.